I'm going to agree with a lot of what both Rick and Bill have said. I've been asked to talk about the implications of the midterm elections and the political situation that they represent for social movements. And um, really what that means is what they mean for the left. Uh, what I want to do is start by making a couple of remarks about the Tea Party and what I think that involves, and then make longer remarks about the kind of challenge I think this poses for the left. The main point I want to make is that the right now has a momentum that the left lacks. I think that's the situation that we have to face. We have to figure out why that is and how we can deal with it. Um, I don't think I have the answers, by the way, but at least I can pose the questions. Um, on the Tea Party, uh, I think one of the questions is, uh, is it a phenomenon of the, well, you could say of the pendulum that Margaret spoke of, or of the volatility that Bill talked about? In other words, is this something that could disappear as fast as it appeared? Uh, to what extent does this represent the vo votes of voters who may have voted Democratic last time and might vote Democratic next time? Um, and to what extent is the Tea Party something that's likely to last? And I would say that it's both. Um, and I think you have to make a distinction between people who voted for Tea Party candidates and activists in the movement. Uh, I think it's quite likely that many of those who voted for the Tea Party are in the uh, pendulum volatility category, people who are reacting to the, uh, the, the economic crisis and the way in which it's been framed. But I think uh, activists in the movement represent something different. Uh, they, what I understand is that uh, activists in the movement, as I think Bill has said, uh, well actually both, both Bill and Rick, uh, are not the white working class, but they are the white uh, lower middle class, middle class, they represent, they are uh, overwhelmingly white, more male than female, uh, relatively old, not really young, in other words, um, large proportion of them southerners or from the south, overwhelmingly Christian, mostly Protestant, uh, and significantly fundamentalists, um, and according to the research of, fr of a friend of mine, uh, more male than female, uh, among the men, strong connections with anti-government movements and white nationalist movements, and among the women, strong connections with uh, the fundamentalist right-wing churches. So what that represents is a specific sector of the American population. Um, and that's a sector that has had politics like this for a very long time, and the difference is that it has been become in the process of becoming politically mobilized since the late 70s, and I think what this represents is an acceleration in its political involvement. My interpretation of this is that this is a sector of the population that used to think that it owned the United States. Uh, these were the people who understood that they were the real Americans. Uh, the movements of the 30s put a little bit of a dent in that uh, because of the, the way in which the movements of the 30s in particular brought immigrants to the fore, and to some extent blacks, though less so. Uh, but it was really the movements of the 60s and the 70s that put a dent in these people's sense that they own the United States, and that's because of the uh, the black movement, movements of people of color generally, the women's movement, the gay and lesbian movement, and the introduction of a whole set of social issues that were very hard for that population to swallow. Oh, I should also have added that the uh, people who make up Tea Party activists also tend to be rural. So we're talking about a population that traditionally has held to a very different set of values than the kinds of values and relationships that we've been talking about since the 1960s. Um, well, so you've got a population that uh, used to feel that America was theirs. They no longer feel that they are the central, that, that they own American identity, so to speak. Um, and they also feel that America has changed in ways that they find unacceptable. 
Meanwhile, uh, in the mid-60s, the extreme right began organizing mass movements. The extreme right realized in the 1960s that if it didn't begin reaching out to a mass constituency, it was going to be gone, began to do that. Uh, and I think it was the intersection of very determined right-wing organizing and a constituency that was, uh, that was open to being organized. Um, and so that's why you get the mass organizations of the Christian right um, in the 80s and the 90s, and then that's why you get uh, the Tea Party with the kind of message it has, the hatred of government, the perception of government, especially a government that still carries something of the vestiges of a New Deal agenda as the cause of its problems. I think what we have to ask is why was it possible for a movement with that kind of power, a movement of the left with that kind of power, to have such an effect over such a short period and why can't we do the same now? Um, the argument I would make is that that movement had a bunch of advantages that we don't have in the US right now, or at least we don't have them to the same extent that the movements of the 30s did. First is, they had organizations. Uh, the Communist Party was organizing the unemployed by the early 1930s. The Communist Party uh, turned to a popular front policy in 1934, just in time to send an army of organizers into the CIO and to help build the CIO. And the Communist Party also played a significant role in building the organizations that made up the popular front. Um, and the popular front really transformed both American culture in terms of sort of the 1930s version of multiculturalism, uh, asserting that we're all Americans, not just white Protestants, uh, and also putting pressure on the New Deal and constructing a new conception of what the, left, the, the state should do. Well, uh, and then, of course, there, there was the labor movement. The huge labor movement of that time was able to make enormous advances. We don't have those organizations. When the right wing began mobilizing, when the extreme right began mobilizing uh, uh, a mass movement in the late 1960s and 1970s, the left was meanwhile beginning to step back from mass movements. Uh, particularly by actually by the late 70s and by about 1980, the focus of the left was on uh, having an influence on the media and on building nonprofits, uh, staff driven nonprofits. So the left began to step back from mass mobilization at just the time when the right was entering that field. Um, uh, second thing is relationship to the state. Uh, FDR did not come into office as an ally of either the left or the labor movement, but due to events, he was pushed in that direction. Uh, and by what's called the Second New Deal by 1935 or so, uh, he had a relationship with the labor movement and indirectly with the left that pushed the New Deal in the direction, in a, in a left-wing direction. What that did was it created an opening for the left and having openings like that, the possibility of participating in the state, the possibility of having an impact on policies, uh, creates a kind of hope and sense of opportunity that makes it possible for mass movements to develop. Um, what's happened recently is that the relationship between Obama and the labor movement and the left has gone in the opposite direction. Obama came in, as Bill said, with a set of fantasies that he represented the left, an exaggeration. Uh, and it was true that he was surrounded by a movement of young people pushing his election. Uh, when Obama got into office, he stepped back from uh, any association with the left, and he also abandoned his base among young people. I think the result of that was profoundly demoralizing for the left, and I don't think the left has gotten over that. Uh, the last thing is that the movements of the 30s had a paradigm, and they had a consensus around that paradigm. The paradigm was 
The problem is the huge gap between the rich and everybody else. Um, the solution is to build a coalition of the working class and the poor on the one hand and the middle strata of society, particularly professionals, around the aim of creating an egalitarian society, a society in which workers and the poor uh, will have more status and better conditions, that such a society will be better for everybody except the very rich. And the way to bring that about is to organize the workers and to force the government to step in on behalf of the interests of the population. So the consensus around that strategy uh, was what made it possible to actually do that. Uh, we don't have a paradigm of that sort. Um, we, don't have, we don't have consensus on the left about what it means to be a radical, uh, and we don't have the organizations that would be able to push such a, a strategy even if we had such consensus. Um, well, uh, I think those are the kinds of challenges facing the American left. And what I should say is that what I should have added to my discussion of the question of organization is that we really no longer have an organized left in the United States. What we have is a large arena of left opinion, a large sector of the population that would like to see a more progressive America, a more progressive and egalitarian America. But it's an arena of opinion rather than an organized arena. Uh, then we have large numbers of nonprofit organizations, many of which are tilted towards the left, but really they involve small staffs. They're not membership organizations. We have an arena of uh, activism among young people uh, that uh, emerges when there are issues to address and then fades, uh, but it's too small and not organized enough to have a major impact. And then if you want to count the labor movement as part of the left, we have the labor movement, but the labor movement is in terrible shape, um, spending most of its time fighting each other rather than doing organizing. Um, I think the situation is... Uh, I think it's also been difficult for the left to seize the opportunity that's offered by the economic crisis because we're not just facing one crisis, we're facing three intertwined crises. Uh, we have the economic crisis, we have the crisis of the environment, uh, and we have the continual threat of uh, uh, of attacks from Al-Qaeda and similar organizations. And it's particularly the third area that the right is much more able to exploit than the left. The left, in fact, barely knows how to talk about it. Uh, but it is very much on the minds of people. Um, uh, even though I think that the environmental crisis is one that the left could better address than the right, the left has not been able to pull itself together to make an adequate response to it. Um, well, so what all of this means is we have to rebuild the left organizationally and we have to build a, um, a, a paradigm, an analysis of what the problem is and an answer to it. Um, I think that if uh, around the question of where hope lies, I think hope lies at this point in the student movement that has been emerging. It was very strong last year. It now looks like it may begin to reemerge. Uh, I think there's the possibility of an immigrant movement. Uh, and I think if there could be a movement within the public sector, for instance, among public sector workers, uh, and a broader movement for a rebuilding of public services, a rebuilding of the public sector as a whole, and a reaffirmation of the common good as the, uh, uh, the central principle around which we re rebuild society, I think there would be hope for rebuilding the left. But I think all of that is a very large challenge.